Welcome back. This lesson is for English 9 for the week of May 25th. This is lesson 1 and follows both the print pathway as well as the digital pathway. I'm Carrie Lockery, a resource teacher with the Office of Secondary English Language Arts. It will be helpful if you gather all the materials for this lesson before we begin. In this lesson, we'll examine the structure and language of Act 3 of Romeo and Juliet. We'll analyze Shakespeare's choices to develop tension and suspense. And we'll analyze the climax of Romeo and Juliet. For today's Think About It, describe the most exciting part of your favorite movie. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Where does that excitement take place? Closest to the beginning, the middle, or the end? If you've watched previous episodes of the English 9 lessons, you'll remember that my favorite story that we've read together this year is The Odyssey. And of course, there are several films made about The Odyssey. So when I think about the most exciting part of The Odyssey, I kind of think about two events that happen almost at the same time. First, Odysseus, still disguised as a beggar, lifts his own heavy bow, bends it, picks up an arrow, and sends the arrow flying effortlessly through a line of 12 ax heads. He then slaughters all the suitors. And that happens almost at the very end of the Odyssey. The part I just described is the climax. And today we'll talk about the climax of Romeo and Juliet. Hopefully this plot structure looks very familiar. We talked about it during the week of April 27th as well as other weeks. You may remember that the exposition was covered in the prologue and part of Act 1, and then the rising action was covered at the very end of Act 1 and Act 2. Now we're at Act 3, and guess what? We're at the climax, so let's talk about that part. To fully understand the climax, we must remember the facts that lead to the exposition, as well as the events that contribute to the rising action. You may remember that in the exposition, these following facts are true. Two feuding families in Verona, Italy in the 1300s. The prince has given the families his final warning about public fighting. Romeo Montague is emotionally fragile due to not being noticed by Rosaline. Paris approaches Lord Capulet about marrying Juliet. By the end of Act 1 and during Act 2, Shakespeare builds tension through these following six events. First, the feast. Tybalt notices Romeo Montague at the party, but Capulet encourages Tybalt not to make a mutiny. Romeo sees Juliet and forgets all about Rosaline. Romeo and Juliet meet, and then they kiss. Act two begins with Mercutio and Benvolio becoming separated from Romeo after the party. They still believe that he is upset about Rosaline. Then we have the balcony scene. Romeo finds Juliet's balcony where he confirms her mutual feelings for him. In this famous scene, the lovers plan marriage, even though their families may not approve. Friar is collecting herbs when Romeo approaches him about wedding him to Juliet. He reluctantly agrees, hoping to unite the feuding families. Then the nurse delivers a message from Romeo to Juliet of the marriage plans. These plans are a secret to both parents. And finally, Friar marries Romeo and Juliet in a secret ceremony, but warns them about possible violence. So what is a climax in literature? Well, it's where the protagonists face the conflict. It is the point of no return. The protagonists will never be the same again. The climax creates suspense, a crisis, or the maximum amount of tension for the protagonist. Also, it's the greatest emotional intensity that we experience as the audience. And it helps prepare us as the audience for the resolution of the action, usually this helps us predict the resolution. Think of the climax as the tip top of the ladder. 
Actually, the word climax comes from the Latin word for ladder. And so the protagonist climbed up all the rungs of the ladder during the rising action, conquering each little obstacle. But now they're at the top of the ladder and they have to face the biggest obstacle. The conflict is always highlighted during the climax. So let's look at a couple examples that could be from real life. Example one, a character and her parent are frustrated with one another. The main character believes she should be a YouTuber, but her parent is unsure about that career. The parent would rather the daughter explore advertising and business. And so the climax is when the character and her parent have a huge argument in which both voice their feelings. Think about how you would predict this is resolved. Well, hopefully the resolution is that both the parent and child can come to a compromise and make an agreement about the future plans of the child. The second example focuses on a young man and his pet. The young adult plays with his energetic dog. The dog pulls out of his collar and runs off. <sighs> now the young man must find his dog. And so the climax is that after looking for hours, maybe he even posted on social media or made some posters, the young man hears barking from around the house. His dog has been found. How might this conflict be resolved? Do you think the young man buys a different collar for his dog? Or does he only play in a fenced in yard? Or maybe the young man decides that when he's playing with his dog, they only play indoors. You notice that the climax forces the protagonist to make a decision and that decision will impact the future. So let's try it. We know that act three is the climax of Romeo and Juliet. So here's the synopsis of act three. Mercutio and Benvolio encounter Tybalt on the street. As soon as Romeo arrives, Tybalt tries to provoke him to fight. When Romeo refuses, Mercutio answers Tybalt's challenge. They duel and Mercutio is fatally wounded. Romeo then avenges Mercutio's death by killing Tybalt in a duel. Benvolio tries to persuade the prince to excuse Romeo's slaying of Tybalt. However, the Capulets demand that Romeo pay with his life. The prince instead banishes Romeo from Verona. Five passages have been selected for you to help you analyze the climax. Let's read passage one from Act 3, Scene 1 together. You can follow along using the resources included in this lesson. As I read, focus on the following questions. What can you infer happens to Mercutio after he is stabbed? Who stabbed him and why might this raise tension? And finally, what do you predict will be the consequence or outcome of Mercutio's injury. Enter Mercutio, Benvolio, and their men. They talk about the hot day and notice the Capulets are also out. Tybalt, Mercutio, thou consortest with Romeo? Mercutio, consort? What, dost thou make us minstrels? And thou make minstrels of us look to hear nothing but discords. Here's my fiddlestick, here's that shall make you dance. Zounds, consort. Benvolio, we talk here in the public haunt of men. Either withdraw unto some private place, or reason coldly of your grievances, or else depart. Here all eyes gaze on us. Enter Romeo. Tybalt, well, Peace be with you, sir. Here comes my man. Romeo, the love I bear thee can afford no better term than this. Thou art a villain. Boy, this shall not excuse the injuries that thou hast done me. Therefore, turn and draw. 
Romeo, I do protest. I never injured thee, but love thee better than thou canst devise till thou shalt know the reason of my love, and so good Capulet, which name I tender as dearly as mine own, be satisfied. Mercutio, O calm, dishonorable, vile submission, all a staccato carries it away, he draws. Tybalt, you ratch catcher, will you walk? Tybalt, what wouldst thou have with me? Mercutio, good king of cats, nothing but one of your nine lives. Tybalt, I am for you, he draws. Romeo, gentle Mercutio, put thy rapier up. Mercutio, come, sir, your pesado. They fight. Romeo, draw, Benvolio, beat down their weapons. Romeo draws. Gentlemen, for shame, forbear this outrage, Tybalt, Mercutio. The prince expressly hath forbid this bandying in Verona streets. Hold, Tybalt, good Mercutio. Romeo attempts to beat down their rapiers. Tybalt stabs Mercutio. Mercutio, I am hurt. A plague, O both your houses. I am sped. Is he gone and hath nothing? Go, villain, fetch a surgeon. Romeo. Courage, man, the hurt cannot be much. Mercutio. <laughs> no, tis not so deep as a well, nor so wide as a church door, but tis enough. Twill serve. Ask for me tomorrow, and you shall find me a grave man. I am peppered, I warrant, for this world. A plague of both your houses. Romeo. I thought all for the best. Mercutio, a plague over both your houses. They have made worms meet of me. Let's discuss the questions. What can you infer happens to Mercutio after he is stabbed? Mercutio says it is just a scratch. Do you notice the irony there? But then he says if you look for him tomorrow, he'll be a grave man. Notice the play on words with the word grave. Mercutio has been fatally stabbed. Who stabbed him? Tybalt. That was in line 91. And this raises tension because Mercutio is killed by his enemy, a Capulet. And so this just reignites the feud. Romeo got in between Mercutio and Tybalt. And so one interpretation is that he holds Mercutio back thus actually causing his own friend to get stabbed. And finally, Romeo's friend is killed by his wife's cousin. And so what do you predict could be the consequence or outcome of Mercutio's stabbing? Well, we know that this could continue the feuding and fighting, and it may even expand the feuding to other members of the families as well as the community. And now this conflict arises inside both Romeo and Juliet, as well as possibly a conflict arising between them. Juliet is going to have to choose whose side to take, her husband's side or her cousin's side. Choose some of the remaining passages to continue to analyze the climax of Romeo and Juliet. In order to show what you know, you have two options. You can compose a short response to the following prompt. Of the passages that you analyzed, which moment most effectively meets the criteria for a climax? Think about referencing your notes from Learn About It for help. Make sure you support your answer with multiple pieces of textual evidence. Another option is to write a text message to the character who you believe causes the most tension in the passages you read for this lesson. Explain why you think their thoughts and actions cause tension. Ask the character at least two questions about the impact of their actions on other characters. I hope this lesson helped you to analyze the climax and to look forward to the falling action and resolution. Make sure you check out the extra resources and learn about it if you need extra help.
See you next time. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. This lesson is for GT9 English, the week of May 25th, Lesson 1. Some of this content will also connect with Lesson 2 of last week, May 18th, and it's all about the literary dinner party that you've been planning. So if you look at the title that I have for us this time, I started out with where do I sit? And I realized where isn't important. It's why. Why are we putting the characters together that we are? What meaning do they create when they spend that time together? So let's take some time. Let's talk about characters and themes and evolving theme statements. And let's get a dinner party off the ground. So I'm not annotating for you this week. I know, big change. I would like you to take a look at the notes that I took as I started to plan my dinner party. That's what the photo is that you'll see on the left of your screen. I started out by brainstorming the major characters that are in each work. At the top, you'll see To Kill a Mockingbird, and then there's Romeo and Juliet, and March, and finally, Lord of the Flies. Now, those aren't all the books, but those are the ones that you can see. So after I brainstormed the characters and the works that we read this year, I thought about how I want to try out different groups of characters together. And as I did that, I really worked to stretch my thinking. I wanted to mix up the genders of characters. What would different characters from different time periods have to say to one another? Would they agree? Would they contradict? What would they show about the themes over time? Well, what happened is I realized I needed more tables and I needed more time to move people around because I think at our pretend party, there would be a lot of really good conversation. So that got me to thinking about connections. What's really important to think about is because we read complex works, and that's part of what gives these work the literary merit that we talked about a lesson or two ago, there's going to be more than one theme. And characters may work to develop themes in very different ways. So as we start thinking through activities like this, be really clear that there's not one thing to focus on and there's not one right answer, but on a path that includes many correct answers, there's a lot of nuances that you can start to consider. And I hope that by moving from theme topics into theme statements, and considering how the characters kind of play in and out of those themes that you start to understand the nuances of those theme statements. With that in mind and knowing what big ideas there are in the books from this curriculum, I thought I'd focus on justice and the idea of right and wrong and good and evil. Again, not the only way I could have gone, but it's one that I feel is a really compelling thread through a lot of these books. And so that's what I wanted to pursue as I was drawing up my dinner party seating chart. So as I said before, the idea that putting different groups of people together and how that changed my thinking about themes and theme statements, that's a really good thing. As you read books and you read books that are increasingly more challenging, as you will do throughout high school and hopefully into college as well, think about how you can really lean in to the complexities of books. What makes a book rich? What is it saying about a theme? Are there a variety of perspectives on one theme? Are there multiple themes that sort of clash or support one another? Does a book ask questions? I hope they do. And then consider, does the book answer the questions? Or is the point not the answer, but the questioning? Themes, as we said before, are really helping us to learn about ourselves, about human nature. So what is the author saying? And again, those complex texts are going to stand up to different readings within reason. You can't blast Dana from an Eastern Shore plantation off into outer space. Can't buy that as a reading. But think about what readings of the text you can support with strong text evidence 
And how can you use that text evidence to start to build up that understanding of theme and get into that really thoughtful, nuanced theme statement writing? So where did I land? Well, it's on that last bullet. I thought about what really stood out to me in each book, and then I tried to create some interesting groups. Theme statements. This isn't new information, but it's definitely worth hearing again. We need to differentiate between theme topics, which are the big ideas, and theme statements, which refine what the author's trying to say. So let's take, for example, love. That's a really big theme topic. So what is the author trying to tell us about love? Well, let's think about the examples of love that we see just in Romeo and Juliet. We have the romantic, passionate, young love of Romeo and Juliet, that kind of foolhardy, love at all costs attitude that ultimately ends up in their deaths. And then we can think about the more measured love that we really see through Lord and Lady uh, Montague. Well, then there's Lord and Lady Capulet who hate each other. I'm feeling an arranged marriage there. And then also that kind of brotherly love and that steadfastness that Romeo has with Benvolio and Mercutio, really important. So if we considered each of those relationships, what would we say about love? It would be a more detailed, more specific statement. What's really important to remember though, is that theme statements are not cliched. If it sounds like it's someone's tagline on a television show or belongs on the inside of a greeting card, it's just not a theme statement. That brings me to my first table at my dinner party. I really struggled with this grouping and I landed on Dana from Kindred, Atticus from To Kill a Mockingbird, John Lewis from March, and Simon from Lord of the Flies. These guys all have a really interesting take on justice and I'm gonna use kind of as a synonym for justice, the idea of rightness and the idea of doing right. Now Dana certainly is encouraging Rufus all the time to do what's right. But she also does that firmly in the context and the understanding of what the time and place will bear and what the 1800s on the Eastern shore of Maryland was like for African-Americans. Atticus in defending Tom Robinson has a much different context, 1930s Alabama, but think about how he looks at the hung jury as progress. And even though he knows he's gonna lose, but he still goes in to fight. John Lewis in March talks about the evolution of his journey and how he's choosing to make steps and what was gained and lost at each of those points. Simon's interesting. He's a little bit of an outlier in this list, but he's definitely one who has a kind of spiritual sense of rightness. He tells Ralph, you'll get out okay. You'll be rescued. Now, a lot of things happen but that idea that right will prevail is certainly important for Simon. Now, to the point that different characters are gonna make different things obvious, I also played around with the idea of having Kevin in this group or Prince Aeschylus from Romeo and Juliet or Benvolio, who's such a reliable reporter. So how would they change this idea of justice and rightness? Okay, but let's go back to my four. I have my theme topic of justice and that idea of rightness. And I thought about what are Dana Atticus, John Lewis and Simon teaching me. So I came up with the idea that justice is imperfect. I think all four of them would agree. And it must be pursued respectfully, diligently and passionately, which all of them in very different ways do. It's fluid, it exists within a context and depends on incremental progress. So think for a minute about how different those two statements are to just say, oh, this is about justice. Okay, but these authors have some really strong ideas. And when we're being really good critical readers, that's where we want to try to land. Let's jump to our next table. Table two. Well, in this table, I put Piggy from Lord of the Flies, Prince Aeschylus from Romeo and Juliet, Kevin from Kindred, and Odysseus. So all of these characters talk about justice and rightness, but again, it's really different. 
these guys to me have a really absolute look at justice and rightness. Piggy is always saying, we need rules. We need grownups. Follow the rules. Prince Aeschylus is the rules. Think about how he breaks up these repeated outbursts of the feud between the Montagues and the Capulets. Kevin gets frustrated with Dana when she returns to California in 1976 when he knows that she hasn't stood up for what's right. But it's what's right in California in 1976. And think about how different that is to her more contextualized look at rightness that we talked about at table one. And then Odysseus, who says, I'm the leader, so I'm right. And there's an arrogance and a kind of gloatingness to it, which, let's remember, annoys Polyphemus, the Cyclops, so much that he throws a hilltop at Odysseus. So what's my theme statement? Well, I'm still looking at that same topic. I haven't left the topic of justice and rightness, but now it's that idea that doing right is a fixed value. People should follow rules and should do the right thing. Now, let's think about how we haven't left the big topic, but how different, because of the interplay of these characters, the more nuanced theme statements become. I have one more table to share with you today. I made a kid's table. So who's here? Telemachus, Odysseus' son. Benvolio from Romeo and Juliet. Remember, we just said he's our reliable reporter. He tells the truth all the time. Rufus from Kindred and Scout from To Kill a Mockingbird. So what, what does this youthful perspective on rightness and justice say? Think about how hard, we could include Jem here too, about how hard it is for Jem and Scout to understand the fight that Atticus is fighting and the attitudes that they know are so clearly wrong. Well, why can't other people see that wrongness as clearly as they do and fight for the rightness that they so desperately want? So how do I end up with a theme statement from this? So looking at the theme topic and statement for this group, we still haven't left that idea of justice and rightness, but now I've taken that idea of coming of age and wrapped it in with the idea of justice. So remembering coming of age is that gaining of an adult understanding of the world. It's typically more cynical, less naive, less fanciful. And certainly we see this in Rufus and Scout, who are the two youngest on our list, but also think too about how Benvolio struggles watching people do the wrong thing. And then Telemachus, who gave up his, this really passionate search that he had for his father, but yet what he learned when upon his father's return, I think is also really interesting as he takes his side in fighting the suitors who've come in to try to get Penelope. Now, these ideas are learned and developed over a lifetime. They get refined, they get shifted, they grow. And all of that is part of your coming of age. So I think that makes this group of four kind of an interesting combination. We need one more table. I'm gonna leave that to you. I hope you've made some really interesting table groupings. And as you finish this lesson and continue on to the show what you know part, really push yourself. What is it that these four would talk about? Who's at your tables? What would they sound like? How do they convey those nuanced theme statements? Live in the big idea first, but then really push yourself to figure out what is it that we need to know that's so important about ourselves and about our world and have your characters talk about that. Have a great time. I hope your dinner party is a smashing success. See you next time.